So the videos will usually take about a day to do. Because this lab is so busy, and I have to come back in here and do a little editing and push them up to YouTube, it takes a little bit of time to do that. And unfortunately, if you look at the schedule for this lab, there's literally one hour in the day on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's not busy. So it's, it's a fairly busy, busy time for everything. So let's look at a couple of items. Has everybody went online and looked at the syllabus already? Has anybody not checked into Blackboard? I can see that, remember. So I'm going to look at this syllabus, and we're going to go over a couple of items that are unique and strange to this one. Enable editing. So a couple of things that are real salient. In Blackboard, if you haven't figured that out, there's some guy named Kenneth Griffin that's supposedly teaching your class. That's actually me. But if you notice on here, it said Bradley P. Well, my parents decided to add this name out in front that nobody ever uses except it shows up on my driver's license. So my name is actually Kenneth Bradley. Nobody ever uses Kenneth, but in our system, we can't make it go away. So if you're ever confused, that's where that, where that actually comes from. So it really is me teaching the class, not some strange twin of mine. If I could twin him off and get extra pay, that would be great, but it doesn't work that way. So most of you know where my office is at. If you're on campus, it's over right beside here in TJ Majors 200. I also hang out in this room a lot when it's not busy for other things. So if you're looking for me, try those, those locations. Office hours, contractually, we have a whole blah, blah, blah. I have five office hours posted here. I am actually here a significant amount more. I am also responsive to emails, voicemails, and other things quite a bit more. My posted office hours are Tuesday, Thursday, 11 to noon, and 1 to 2, just so I have a lunch break so I can go over and eat some of that fabulous cafeteria food or bring my own lunch, which is usually what I do. Um, and on Wednesday, I list 1 to 2 p.m. Now, I will send out at some point a list of hours that I am generally here, but I am not posting them as required. And the, and the reason has to do with, if I list them as I am having office hours, I am not here for some reason or something else comes up, I have to take off sick leave or something else for them. So, My telephone. Don't use the 2259. It really doesn't ever get to me. It leaps here, and if I don't answer within three rings, it goes back to the secretary. They'll eventually take a note and email me. If you would like to leave me a voicemail, use the 957-1320. That's a Google Voice number. It sends me a text and says, hey, you've got a voicemail. Or if I pick it up, it texts me and says, hey, you've got a phone call. You can actually text to that number. It's a much, much better contact method. Probably the best method, though, is leaving it at my email address. We probably will use things like Skype, so I've given you my Skype address. Sometimes we can do things online. I can show you much quicker than going back and forth in 10 or 20 or 30 emails. So I'd sometimes create videos and we'll send those and put those other places. So clearly, you guys that are in here today have all figured out that we meet Tuesdays and Thursdays, 9 30 to 10 45. If you weren't in here for this class, then you know, I'm not sure where you are. Important note, all of our weeks I end at 10 p.m. on Sunday night. So it ends a little earlier. Some classes we end at midnight on Sunday, some at other times. 10 p.m., so make sure you no take note of that. If you start these assignments later on at 9.55, you are going to be sad students. Some of these assignments, and we'll talk about it later, will take some time to complete. Especially when we're actually doing the coding, you may find that you have a single period or something really silly wrong in your code, and you're going to be bashing yourself in the head trying to get it finished or completed or make it work. And if you don't allow yourself time to do that, you're going to be, be pretty sad. So I appreciate you guys' patience on here. Because the book has changed a little bit from where we started a couple months ago. So we were going to use a book that was in Cengage Unlimited, since we have kind of standardized Cengage Unlimited in our CMIS classes. That plan's great. If you have multiple classes, you only pay the $120 once, except that the book we were going to use is no longer now part of Cengage Unlimited. 
they wanted $292 or some crazy amount for it. And I said, no, we'll go back and use an older book. And so this is the textbook for about the next two-thirds of the class. So we actually use kind of a free open source guide for part of it. And then we're actually going to use this as our guide into the language of Python itself. This can be had anywhere at our bookstore, Amazon. I think on Amazon it's like 15 bucks, so it's really cheap. So you will need a copy of this. You do not need it today. How many of you have already bought this book? Sweet. How many of you? Nicely. How many of you should go out and buy this book? You can find it really, really cheaply. So the other textbook, and we'll show it to you here in just a second, is really an online version of, of the old version of this. So we have actually combined a couple of classes, or parts of a couple of classes. We used to have a class called Programming Logic and Design. You can't really go coding unless you understand the logic and the flow of information behind what you're going to code. Think about if you told some 14-year-old, here's the gas pedal and it does this, here's the steering wheel and it does this, go drive a car. How does that work when you first went out and drove? You kind of understood how it worked, but it didn't work very well, right? So similar to that, we're going we're gonna to go through some concepts in here, and then we're going to get into actually getting you guys into this coding. The great thing about Python, Python's compiler and all the software we're going to use is free. So we are not making you pay anything else. So this should be a pretty cheap, from a textbook standpoint, course for you. All right, so there's our book. What kind of software do you need? You will need something to write documents in. I don't really care what it is, as long as you can save it in a .doc format. So you will need administrative rights to a computer. So if you are using an employer's computer or your mom's computer or whatever, and you don't have the ability to add a piece of software, you're going to have a little bit of an issue you are going to have to install some software for Python. It's not very big, but you are going to have to install it. That said, there is a Python compiler for Windows. There's a Pilot one for Mac. There is a version out there for if you're running Unix. If you want to do it on an Android tablet or a MacBook, you can do it. There are versions of that. They don't necessarily all look exactly the same, so my suggestion is, since we're using a Windows platform here, to try to use the Windows platform. And that way you'll see exactly what we see. And so you will, you will probably have the best luck with that. So More blurbage in here. And I did not print these out on purpose. You can go in and grab this anytime. So blah, blah, course description, blah, blah, blah. What do I want you to do when you leave? you're going to be able to create algorithms to solve business problems, is my hope. In other words, we're not just teaching you a little bit of Python, a little introduction to programming. We're really getting you in that mindset of how do I problem solve. And whether you use that in business, you use that in your life, getting those ability, that steps to problem solve, break things down into small pieces and fix them, is a really great skill. So we're going to learn basic programming techniques. We're going to look at solution strategies. And we're going to think about what programming concepts you might use. So when you leave this class, are you going to be able to probably design the latest, greatest game out there after one little class? It's possible. Some people have done very, very well out of that. On the other hand, do I want you to be able to use some of these concepts and ideas, whether it's Python or whether it's another language? Because right now, there's over 600 different programming languages out there. So how do we pick which one to even use? How did we pick Python? It is compatible with other. It's very English-like. The sentence structure in here looks very much like English when we use it. There are a lot of different languages out there. The reality is, if we're going to teach you on the back end, how to think about those languages and apply those constructs, whether you're doing it in Fortran or Lisp or Python or C++, you'll be able to apply those. 
And if you're hiring a programmer or a programming company, you'll be able to understand those ideas and those thoughts and those processes as we go. So scroll down a little more. So we're going to have both lecture. So you're going to come in here, and I'm going to yell at you for a while, and then you're going to look at me blankly, and then we're going to go do it on hands-on. This class is different than any other class you've probably been to in that if you do not participate, you will not pass. I don't want to sound that in a negative way because it's a very easy class to pass, but you have to participate. You have to go through the book and actually try programming ideas. You have to type. You have to do those concepts. This is not a class where you can just listen, listen to me talk and then take a quiz and you're going to pass it. Unfortunately, that's not the way programming works. Think about like riding a bike. I can tell you all about riding a bike. But when you go out to actually ride that bike, is it different? Yeah, very much so. So you have to actually do that. I will have nearly everything up on Blackboard. Probably everything, I hope. If something's changing, I will make announcements on Blackboard. If we have weather events or something else, it will appear on Blackboard, and we will let you know what's going on. So again, I have the warning about assessment and grading and showing up and doing stuff. So there are assignments every week. Every week we have an assignment. If you do not do those, you will not pass the class. Again, I, I don't want to be kept a negative. I'm just throwing that out there. And here is the one problem with this class that is different than any other. I do not take late assignments for a very good reason. Once we get to the end of an assignment, we post a solution and in some cases, you guys are posting your solutions to that problem. It would not be fair to the rest of the class if I said, oh, no, you go ahead and do that when solutions are then available. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you have to do it. You have to do it on time. Start early. Ask questions if you run into problems. Don't wait till the last minute. So there are weekly assignments. There are also discussion boards but only in the last half of the class. And you'll see why later on why we're doing that. So there are exams. So the first six weeks, we have exams. So when we're going through this particular guy, the programming logic and design, we have a really quick quiz each week about the material we're looking at. The last half, you don't have quizzes. Everybody go, yay, that's really great. And then we have a, a final, the final, that date is absolute. If you're enrolled in this class on campus, that date for the final, you must be here. So plan your travel accordingly. Online, I will have the final available open the day of the final for this class on campus, plus one additional day since I know that we're, we're taking those things asynchronous. Late assignment. Unless you have some really, really horrible, terrible, you're in the hospital, your leg is broken, your arm is broken, you've got a metal plate in your head, we are not doing any kind of late assignments. If I do late assignments, it's a completely different assignment. So if you know you have something coming up that you are not going to be here, you're going to get in an auto wreck and you know ahead of time, plan, plan accordingly. Now, so... What I'm saying is take some responsibility. You guys will all do fine. But if something comes up, let me know. I can help at the onset. I can't help at the end of the class. You go, I haven't been at class all year because I got in a car wreck and my legs are broken. Had I known ahead of time, we could have done something about that. I probably couldn't have fixed your broken legs. I'm not a surgeon. So this is a breakdown of the points. So. We use the 90, 80, 70 grade scale like everything else. There is a grade appeal policy. If you feel that the grade you got in this class was not satisfactory to you, and the reason for that is it fell into one of a couple of very narrowly defined categories, not simply, I got all A's in every other class, why didn't I get an A here, but that I gave you different quizzes, different assignments, different tests, I treated you differently. I picked on you. Some of you I'm going to pick on anyway. Probably everybody by the end of the year will get picked on. 
But if there's something different in how you were treated or how your class was structured, that becomes an appealable reason. Not simply, hey, I didn't do half my assignments and you wouldn't take late work. That one doesn't, doesn't work necessarily. But I would hope it doesn't come to that if you have a problem or an issue. Talk to me. I'm really not as scary as it seems. So the other piece on here I want to talk about is disability services. And we have more and more students who are reaching out and they have some form of a disability. We have a service for that and an office that you can go and contact. There are testing accommodations and other things that if you are listed in our, our center that you can receive. This is really a great thing. We have students graduating and taking care. The, the reality though is you need to make that contact with the disability services and then there's some responsibilities in terms of coming back and, and presenting that information to me. They also will do things like if you need extended testing time and it's outside of our normal classroom, they have some forms and things. So if you have any concerns or any questions about that, there is an email address in here, or you can certainly contact me and I will we'll do that. That's one of the things if you want to do that offline and not serve them in, in class. We also have tutoring available. These are student tutors. There are should be some students who have had some experience in programming over there. So if you get a start on that, I would probably be encouraging that. Student groups, tutoring, all those kinds of things are really great. There is also a writing center. It will probably not apply for this class, but I leave it in there because I like to encourage you to use that. If you have classes that have writing assignments, it is always a good idea to have somebody else take a look at them. When I take courses, I like to have other people evaluate my work also so that stupid grammar or spelling mistakes that my brain has already said are correct will get caught. It's a really great resource, and I'm glad we do that. Academic integrity policy. Don't cheat. Fair enough. If you get caught cheating, and I have had people in a programming class try to cheat, there are a million ways to solve some of these problems. If your code looks line for line as we get further in, line for line like somebody else's, that tells me you probably cheated. If your code at the end has comments that have written in somebody else's name, that tells me you cheated. If the guy that you paid to write the code and you didn't pay them calls me and says, hey, can you get student XYZ to pay me for that code I wrote for him for class, you probably cheated and got caught that way. And that is actually a true story. So don't cheat. You guys all have the ability to do it. What I find are people that do any kind of cheating are the ones that tend to wait to the last minute and you panic and you go, holy cow, what can I do to pass? Don't wait to the last minute. Don't panic. There are always ways to get that done. Equal opportunity notice. So Title IX applies. And originally this was really just about sports, or at least we thought it was. The reality is, do you all want to be treated fairly and equally? Does anybody want to be picked on unmercifully in class? Keep nodding your head very much. Yeah. So what it really says is, am I going to treat everybody fairly and equally? If you think anywhere on campus, quite frankly, that you are not being treated equally for any reason, we have a, an office and a person you can reply to. So Yolanda Cade is actually our equal opportunity officer here on our campus. Use that if you feel that you have an issue. That's your voice if you feel that, that I am picking on. And so as an example, if I came in here and I said all women need to wear short skirts to class, that would be an example of violating that equal rights, wouldn't it? Liam is... I see trouble over in this area right here. So, Or if I said all men have to wear yoga pants. Same kind of thing, right? So those kinds of things, if I am picking on you for race, religion, ethnicity, any of those areas, that's where we come from. So, but use it all over campus. So that is my spiel about our syllabus. Any questions on the syllabus? 
Ah, oh, it was too easy. I'm going to have to figure out a way over there to separate. I sense this. I sense trouble. All right. So the next part of our class, let's look at, if you go into assignment one, week one, at the very top is a PDF file. That PDF file is essentially this textbook, an old version of it, that we are going to use to start us off. So rather than make you go buy another $10 or $15 book, we just have it in there as a PDF. So for those of you who like to physically hold a book in your hand and read it, sorry, Dolores. I am now picking on you because of that. But the price is right. So I have it open, and we'll take a look at some of the items in there really quickly so you can see what it looks like. So it is an old version. If you look at the dates in there, but the reality is these items that we're going to work with haven't changed. And so we're actually going to go through essentially chapters 1 through 6. So we're going to get an overview of what a computer does, how it does it, and some of the structures and things that we have inside. That gives us that groundwork that tells us how we need to pedal those, that bike sprocket around or how we need to turn. And we, we get those pieces in there. So this first week, we're reading chapter 1. And so if I look back here, chapter 1, there is a quiz for chapter 1. Read the book first, little hint. I've had people try to take quizzes before they read the book. Read the book. I believe there's 20 multiple choice questions. Dolores, have you taken it already? No? Okay. And then we have an assignment in here. So. We're going to talk about a few of those things, but I need you to read the book. And that's one of the things I will, I will beg and I will ask is you are going to have to read the material ahead of time for it to make sense. So pull up my PowerPoint. So we, we can't do anything unless we have PowerPoint. So PowerPoints are, are the way we operate. But... I'm not going to go through a whole ton of it because you haven't read the book. Has anybody read chapter one yet? In the Python book. Well, you can read the Python book, chapter one, and we'll get to that one here fairly quickly, but for now, you need to read in this one, that PDF that we gave you, chapter one. So we're going to talk about computers and logic, and I'm going to go over a couple of things that I think are a little more critical. So I want to divide software as we think about it, into two different groups. So you've used both. You've used both. Most of you have used Windows. Has everybody in here used a Windows computer? You're sitting in front of one, so I hope you say yes. Has anybody in here used a Mac? Yeah, a couple of you. Have any of you used a Unix or Linux style operating system? A couple of you. If you've been in one of my other classes, you might have seen that a little bit. How many of you have used an Android tablet or a phone? How many of you have used an iPhone? If I don't have everybody's hands up at some point in here, you guys have all used system software. That system software is what manages our computer or our phone or in some cases maybe our thermostat. It's that system software. Application software, though, is then that software we actually use to do things. So, when I fire up Windows, can Windows on its own really do anything for me? There are very few little programs included with Windows. That system or that application software then is things that we have that will actually do things. Programs like Word, PowerPoint, Excel. Those are all applications. They sit on top of that system software and allow us to actually do something. If you think about it, they are task oriented programs. Now, are there programs inside of Windows that, that also do things? When I fire up Windows, does it have WordPad? Yeah, and it's got a few other programs. They really set kind of on top. The system software, we can, we can take all of that out of Windows, and Windows is still going to run. And it's still going to be that base platform for our computer. So we need to think about a few other things that are in here. Input. 
So it says we're going to get input from a keyboard and a mouse. Are there other ways to get input? What other way can I get input on a computer? A flash drive? I'm going to say microphone. Flash drive's a little different. We'll talk about storage. But a microphone. Can you talk to your computer? How many of you send text by talking to your phone right now? Yeah. And how many of you get interesting results when you do that? Occasionally. Are there other ways? What about a touch screen? Does anybody know somebody who is visually handicapped? As in completely blind and has to rely on like Braille. Close. They're not that thick yet. But can we get data in that way? Sure. What about a scanner for a paper document? Is that a form of input? So we can get sound, we have touch screens, we have all those different ways that we get things into our computer. Well, once we get it in there, we're going to do something with it. And that's called processing is the term we're going to use. In other words, we take all that data and we manipulate that data. And the reality is everything we do inside that computer is really a form of math, right? Our computers are really dumb. By the end of this class, you're going to realize how dumb they are, and you're going to yell at them a lot. But the reality is, all that computer you're looking at is nothing more than a set of light switches. The computer can really only understand 0 and 1. That's all it does, 0 and 1. And it does that processing of those zeros and 1s in something called the CPU, that processor. So when you go buy a computer and you go, Man, I'm going to go buy a computer with the latest Intel i7. That i7 is a processor. If I go buy an AMD or if I buy a phone, they all have a processor inside of it. The more money I spend on it, the faster it can process, but it all does kind of the same thing. It manipulates that data around. And then we have the idea then we processed it, we need to do something with it. We send it out. So where can I send it out to? My computer has manipulated all my Tinder profiles with, for Liam over there. What can it do with that information? How can it how can it output it? Well, you're looking at a screen. That's one method. Are there others? Great sound. It can put it out as a sound. It can put it on a piece of paper. Are there any others? And then generally we take that output and we want to save it. And so there's where we get into the disks and the different flash and the memory. And we're not going to get a whole lot of that right this second. But a lot of times we do want to store that. We manipulate all of our data and we want to find a way to store it. So we have some more terms for you. We know I love terms. So computer instructions, or what is telling our computer what we're going to do, is something called a programming language. There's over 600 of them out there, probably closer to 1,000, maybe over that at this point, of different kinds of programming languages. So when I write that, I pick that language that's appropriate for the task, that's appropriate for the computer. So we will talk later on about how we pick one. But right now we know that whatever my instructions are, are in a programming language of some sort. So when I write something, I'm coding or I'm writing a piece of code. And I have to have certain rules about it. And then we call those rules syntax. Just like in, our, in your English language, there are rules about how we do things. So subject, verb, noun, those kinds of things. Kind of that same kind of syntax. So I'm going to pick on Anthony. So syntax, does it vary from language? And because I know that you are at least trilingual, picking on you, there's several people in class that I know know multiple languages. I see you, Heidi. Are syntax different from some languages to other languages? 
Is there a difference between Portuguese and English in the way sentences are arranged? Yeah. In between Spanish and Portuguese, to make it even more confusing, even though some of the words are very similar. Great. Even in English, do we have weird syntax rules? It's how we build that, that language. And so syntax is really just those rules about how we, how we use particular code words and key phrases. This is going to be the part that is going to drive everybody absolutely crazy. Because when I write a sentence or I say a sentence, you guys are really smart. And if I miss a period or a semicolon, or I put the instead of and, or I leave out and, you guys probably will still understand what I'm saying, right? Your computer is literal. It doesn't. It's going to go, what? I don't know what you tried to tell me to do, but it's all wrong and nothing's going to happen right. And so where we usually come up with errors isn't the logic of the program. It's really the syntax. How is that program coded? And we have a syntax error. And you will find that there are things that will drive us absolutely crazy. So if you put a colon instead of a semicolon, is that easy to spot? No, they look very similar. And our brain already says, hey, I know I'm supposed to have a semicolon there. And they become hard to grab. If you've been in web design class, and I know some of you have, this is the same thing in syntax that probably drove most of you crazy. One small punctuation error at the beginning of your code, and what happens to your entire web page? It's messed up, doesn't look right. So syntax, then, is that idea of how things are arranged in our coding. So, a couple more pieces. So, each programming language uses something different in its syntax just to make life better for everybody. And all at the very basic level, our computer can only understand zeros and ones. At the very basic level, your computer is nothing more than a light switch turning off and on. So zero, one. It's that simple. And we have billions of them in there, but we still have to communicate with them. And they're just zeros and ones. Little tiny zeros and little tiny ones. We do a lot of them. So we call that binary. So you were going to work with binary and, and you're going to figure out some, some things with it. Luckily, we have in between the computer, because if we had to write our code in zeros and ones, that would be really painful. Luckily, in between, we have something called a compiler. Now, there's really a technical difference between a compiler and an interpreter, but for our purposes, we'll call them very similar. So we're going to write an English language style sentence with some specific structure that says, print, I can speak four languages, whatever I can. But it sounds really impressive when you say that. And it's going to print it up on the screen or put it out in the printer. The compiler takes that language that I just said, print, I can speak four languages, and converts that into that language of zeros and ones that the computer can understand. So in between us is a compiler. So what we are going to download eventually is the Python compiler. That compiler is going to take our code and convert it to a language that the computer can understand. We're going to then have code, and it's going to create a little file, and we're going to run that file. And when we run it or execute it, we run our little code, we execute it, hopefully it works correctly. So when that program runs, if our coding is all correct, we get our, our output that we were looking for. But we're assuming we got all the syntax right. So there's another error we can have. So we can have an error in syntax, or we can have a logic error. In other words, we didn't design it correctly, 
It ran, and it did exactly what we told it to do, and what we told it to do was wrong. And so the second kind of error we can have is called a logic error. The program runs. It does exactly, exactly what we told it to do, and yet it doesn't produce the re right result. So we have had some spectacular examples of these things go wrong. The program worked, and yet, because of some kind of a logical error, we have an issue with it. So, logical errors are actually a little more difficult. When a program doesn't run because of a syntax error, we have some clues and we know, hey, the program didn't run. When we have a logic error, though, then we have a little harder time finding out what the problem is. Because the reality is, it ran, it seems to give us an answer. Is that answer correct? So logic errors are harder to correct. So that's why we go through a lot of working on this, how to solve algorithms correctly. All right, so today I'm going to stop here. We're going to finish up on, on Thursday, so you need to read that first chapter. We will also look at this assignment then a little bit, once we get to that, to that, uh, into that. So make sure you read so we can talk about these kinds of things. And then we'll also bring out some examples of some logic errors. So some of them can be very minimal. Great. A light doesn't show up on a Christmas tree. But they can also be very significant. The brakes don't work in my car. That's pretty significant. And we've had some, General Motors had some programming errors where in certain conditions, the brakes would not work on your car. That's probably pretty significant. We've also had ones, for example, where NASA lost a satellite because somebody didn't code logically correct, and they didn't, in this particular case, they didn't convert from scientific notation correctly to English units. So in other words, they didn't convert meters to feet correctly. They put out a number. It looked correct. $500 million later, it went, oh, crap, that didn't work. Well. All right, so you need to read chapter one of the Programming Logic and Design book probably 17 times if you would read through that. Okay, 16 and a half per month. It's not very hard to read. They're pretty short little chapters in there. So make sure you read that. Look through that. I have the PowerPoints up if you want to look at them so you can kind of see what the high points are. There is a quiz if you're feeling really brave, but I would probably wait until after we talk about it one more time. And there, is, there will be a quiz for each week then as we go through here for the first six weeks, and then they're over. And then we only have the final. All right, any questions as we start in on this endeavor? Anybody scared yet? Nah. There's nothing. This, this class seems like, and I know I preached a little about you have to stay on top of it, but it's a 200 level course. The only people that have ever failed this class are the ones that quit trying. And usually they disappeared after the first week and we never saw them again. All right. If you do have questions on anything, email me, come into my office, wander in. Don't call the 2259. It's the only, I have to put it on there because it's technically my office number, but it really is probably the worst way to, to ever get a hold of me. All right, let's get out of here early on our one and only time. We'll get to take advantage of that. Yes, let me finish my recording and I will answer. <laughs>